So hi, everyone. Um, today, this is a very special episode. Uh, welcome on Ping. This is a podcast about uh, conscious leadership. And I'm receiving uh, Seth Godin, that you probably know. He's a very famous marketer, famous uh, writer. He, write, he wrote uh, The Purple Car, also This Is Marketing. I mean, many books that are all bestsellers. And the last book is The Song of Significance, a, a new manifesto for teams. And if I understand correctly, Seth, this is uh, the closest book to you. Uh, I would like to know or to understand why. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, a long time ago, I started writing books about marketing and I started shifting the definition of what marketing was because before I started doing this work, marketing and advertising were the same thing. People came to understand that what marketers do is run ads or hype stuff. And I kept changing it to Marketing is the story we tell. Marketing is leadership. Marketing is making a change happen. And what I am doing in this book is, as someone who's been doing this for 40 plus years, talking about how the world has changed, the end of the industrial era, the whole idea that what we want from each other is humanity, not more stuff. Uh, a few minutes ago, I was talking to my friend Apollonia Poulen, who... Oh. Uh, Runs an she's important. A, she's bakery. a very good friend of mine, and yes. uh, she she was the first. Uh, she's a she was the first person I invited on the podcast. Actually, <laughs> she's fantastic. I've known her yes. her whole life. And um, why do people go to the Poulen Bakery? They don't go because they have a bread shortage. You can get cheaper, more industrial bread ten different places before you get to her bakery. They go because a human being made it, because you were seen, because you were connected, because you were part of something. And this significant work is the work we all want to do. And I felt like it was a time to stand up and say, you know what? We've been indoctrinated into believing that what we have to do is be cogs in a system that's hurting all of us, but we don't have to be. And the weird thing is we are kind of conscious that it's happening and yet we don't know how to get out of it. Um, um, and for me, w one of the answer you're bringing is, how you describe the, the issue with HR, human resources. Maybe you want to tell that story because I think it was, I mean, when, you, when, I, uh, when I read it, I was like, huh, that's interesting. I never thought about that like that. Well, you know, where did human resources come from? Because when we had a farm, we didn't have a human resources department. When we started the factories, we didn't have it. But Frederick Taylor uh, met Henry Ford and Henry, Frederick Taylor had a stopwatch and Henry Ford had a factory. And they had both figured out that if you get better machines, you can improve your productivity. And improved productivity means you can increase your profit and your output. What Frederick Taylor figured out is that people can be treated like machines. And that if we hold our stopwatch next to them and measure every single step they do, we can turn people from people into a resource. So as soon as we say human resources, what we're saying is there's an org chart, do you fit? Will you follow instructions? How can I surveil you? How can I increase your output? And people don't want to be a resource. They want to be humans. Hmm. And you, you just mentioned the end of the industrial era. And in the book, you, you differentiate industrial, industrial capitalism and market capitalism. Can you just explain us what is the difference to you and uh, how it does make a difference nowadays when we are a leader in this society? So market capitalism is, I think, innate, and it is the single best way we know to create value, which is find a problem and solve it. Offer people a choice, and if they want to buy it, they will. No one buys anything unless it's worth more than you are charging for it. When you can see the market and engage with the market, that opens the door to all sorts of uh, benefits. There are side effects as well. We're going to talk about that later. Industrial capitalism says, I have more machines than my competition, and my job is to crank the machines as fast as I can, to sell average stuff to average people, to get as close as I can to lock in to market power. And we needed it. It got us cars. It got us airplanes. It got us food. Because if you just keep turning the crank, you can grow a lot more corn. Mm -hmm. um, my argument is we can't turn the crank any faster than we've been turning it. That what we've done to our climate, what we've done to each other, can't keep happening. And so since we can't get a, 
a more of a discount from going faster, we have to take a deep breath and say, okay, we did that. We did it enough. Now that we have it, what are we going to do with it? And you're talking about the race of the, to the bottom, which I love, especially I, I heard you on a podcast talking about uh, money, you know, and I was thinking about post, um, startup that are working as crazy and making their team work as crazy to get as much money as they can. And you, you are explaining that this is a race to the bottom. Uh, and I would love to understand why. So there's nothing in the book that argues that money is a bad thing. And no. if you can make a lot of money by serving a lot of people and the side effects are small, I'm not opposed to that. What I'm arguing is there's two ways to make money. One way to make money is to race to the top, to charge a lot but deliver more than you charge, to create possibility by being uniquely you. The other way is to race to the bottom, which is to cut corners, to lower your price, to dumb it down, to ignore the side effects, and to do it again. And the problem with racing to the bottom is you might win or you might come in second. And if you do that, you have to live at the bottom. And the alternative, I think, is generative to turn on lights and open doors. Because when we do those things, we can do it again tomorrow and we can do it with pride and satisfaction. And to, to your understanding, is it how we arrive in a situation where the, the most important job are the less paid for? Because that, that's a very weird, for me, I mean, I'm always uh, struck by this situation where the most important job, and we've seen that during the COVID um, Uh, period, but the most important job are the less paid or the most, yeah. And I, I don't really understand why is, it is that so. Is that because of what you just explained? Well, let's decode this. The reason that some jobs are paid more than other jobs, assuming we're not talking about someone who owns an asset, is supply and demand. If you need a heart surgeon and there aren't a lot of heart surgeons, heart surgeons can charge more than somebody who you know, bakes the potatoes at the store because lots of people can learn to bake the potatoes. So supply and demand is one thing. But from a marketing point of view, what I'm arguing is the most important person in every customer interaction your organization has is the person who's talking to the customer. And that person tends to be the lowest paid person in the organization because you need a lot of them. And talking to the customer is not a certified Uh, a credential job, it's generally seen as someone who is sort of like a clerk. So my argument is not that we can have, with the system as it currently is seen, everyone in the organization be the highest paid person. Mm -hmm. But what I'm arguing is, as a marketer, you need to spend more time training and rewarding and developing your frontline workers Because just because there are a lot to choose from doesn't mean the job isn't important. It's vitally mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. There is a quote in the book that I loved. I'm going to read it uh, out loud. Um, it is, the conductor of an orchestra doesn't make a sound. It depends for his power on his ability to make other people powerful. And I think it's, it's, it, it resonates with what you just said. Uh, the, the leadership is about making other people powerful and not the opposite somehow. Right. Right. So leadership and management, correct yes. me. Is, are they the same word in French? They're probably I different. mean, we, we don't really have word. I mean, management is a French word. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's where it's coming from. That's fully French. Uh, leadership, we don't really have a word in English, for, in, in French in the, for that, because we say, uh, you know, uh, chef, but it, it means um, something different. Leader is... And that's actually a trick in our language. Um, we don't really have a word for leader, and we don't understand it very correctly in French, I think, in France. Sorry. So, okay, Joan of Arc, she was a leader. No one yes. worked for Joan of Arc. She didn't get to tell people what to do. She led them. And you don't have to be burned at the stake to be a leader, but what it is to be a leader is to acknowledge you are not a manager. The manager has authority. The manager tells other people how to do the steps. The leader uses influence. The leader is doing something that might not work, 
in order to make things better for the people they serve. So if I think about the difference between a cook and a chef in English, the cook follows the recipe. The chef creates the conditions for the cook to be able to do their job. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to be a leader, we have to accept that it's voluntary, that people have to choose to lean into possibility. We cannot manage that. If we do, we're just managing. And <laughs> so when the world is changing, we need leaders more than ever. Like when the world was the same every single day, then you need a manager. So mm -hmm. the fast food restaurants, they need managers. But for example, when uh, McDonald's first showed up in Paris, they couldn't just bring the Chicago version to Paris. So they had a leader who invented new ways for them to be in the store, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm arguing in the book is we all have the tools of leadership now because you don't need a factory anymore. You have a keyboard. And if you have a keyboard, you can make a change happen, but you can do it by voluntarily signing people up, not by ordering them to do something. So for you, what does it take to be a leader? What, what is a good leader? Uh, someone who will lead that I understand for sure. But uh, is there any specific, uh, how would you describe a leader? Well, the humility that comes from being a good leader is the source of their ability because they are giving other people the power to take action because managers need to keep all the power so they can fire people and tell people what to do. But the leaders have to create the conditions for other people to see what they see. And so it's a radical act of empathy to be able to say, do you want to enroll in this? Do you want to go where I'm going? And if someone says no, you say, thank you for thinking about it. And if they say yes, you say, here we go. But once you have enrollment, then you can move. If you don't have enrollment, if you don't have people who are eager to come with you, it becomes very difficult. And how do you get this uh, ongoing motivation to go on? And also, I want to talk about uh, the fact that some people can leave the company And, and, and I think you are claiming that this is okay, uh, actually, when people leave the company. It's actually excellent. Turnover is a good thing. Okay. Because if you are managing and the people you, who work for you have no choice, they have no better options, they have to stay where they are, well, then don't expect that they will eagerly enroll in where you're going. They will do the minimum because you've trapped them, right? The leader says... We're going over there. This is what it's going to be like around here. If it isn't what you want, I will help you find another job. Please post your resume to LinkedIn. Please go find out. If there's a, if there's a better place for you, I am failing for you. You shouldn't be part of this. The goal is not to pretend our people don't have options. The goal is to give them options so the ones who stay are eagerly enrolled in going on the journey. Think about any organization that you can look at with pride and excitement. Oh, what they built is important. What they built is important. The people who are there aren't there because they have no choices. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, actually, uh, that's actually very true. I mean, some people, most people uh, don't really have a choice because of, uh, of the money, uh, basically. We're well, going back to that, sub with, with, to that subject, but it is very connected to, to money eventually. No, they do um, have a choice. I disagree with you. They have okay. been brainwashed into thinking they don't have a choice. But of course, they have a choice. That there are definitely people in countries that aren't yours or mine that are in servitude, that are there's way too much human trafficking. Mm. But leaving those people aside, we have choices. And, you know, in my country, the biggest employer is Walmart. Mm -hmm. The Ability to go get a job at Walmart is there for a lot of people. And once you get a job at Walmart, you can either say, I have no choice. This is the only job that's available to me. Or you can realize that on weekends, there's all sorts of things that you can do, whether they're gig sorts of work or new mm -hmm. job sorts of work. And then you keep working your way up. If you're a doctor, you can choose to be a doctor who's on the, the grinding path to be a certain kind of surgeon, but you can go work in that emergency room. There are choices. Mm -hmm. So, We've been persuaded that if our boss is a jerk, we have no choice. We have to put up with it. I don't that's believe true. that's true. 
And mm. that doesn't mean you're going to make as much money tomorrow, mm -hmm. but it means there are paths for you. And we only get to live this life one time. And to keep compromising, to make an extra few francs a day, makes no sense to me. I think we have to mm. stand for something and do work that's significant. Otherwise, what are we waiting for? Are you familiar with uh, what Uber Jolie did at um, Best Buy or not? At Best Buy, tell me. Best Buy, you know, you know Best Buy for sure. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with what uh, Uber Jolie did? Uh, a, he was the CEO for many years. He is actually now he's a teacher at Harvard, and he wrote a book about um, the love within the, the employees and uh, how can you lead with love, basically. Yes, I was and talking. I was, I was in a Best Buy yesterday, and I was talking about this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like what, why is Best Buy the last one left in, in my country, right? That all the other stores went mm -hmm. out of business. And one model is we have to be on defense. We have to protect what we have. Every bit of turnover is a bad thing. Every uh, chance we have to lower cost is what we have to do. And the other way to do it is to say, what if people had a choice? What if they had a choice about where to shop? What if they had a choice about where to work? guess what? People have a choice. And if we acknowledge and embrace that choice. So, you know, the late Tony Shea, who I knew, he mm. was the person who did this in the most extraordinary way. 100%. Right? Which is after you got a job in their call center, they trained you for two or three weeks. And if you were still the kind of person they wanted to work there, they sat you down and they said, here's 3,000 US dollars. We will give it to you if you quit today. So think about that. After you've been wow. trained, they would pay you money to quit. Well, why would wow. he do that? He did it because if you took the money, they didn't want you. If you oh, wow. said, it's worth it to me to stay here, then you were enrolled in the journey. That is available to just about anyone who wants to lead an organization. Find people who want to go where you're going and wish the others well. And how do you keep this energy going uh, on the long run when, when you have employees that are super motivated in the first place, like the, the one you described, how do you keep that going? Uh, I, I was wondering, is there a magical trick? Or <laughs> well, if you see, think of it as a trick, it's definitely not going to work. That's true. You know, one thing you'll notice about uh, the huge widening gap in wealth is that rich people keep working. Why do they keep working? Right? They keep working because it fuels them. It gives them a story to tell themselves. It they found status and affiliation in that work. Well, we know the same thing can happen for the people who aren't the boss. Andrew Carnegie had more millionaires working for him 100 years ago than anyone had ever thought could, would be possible. Why, how do you get a millionaire to go work for you again at the steel mill? Well, how do we create an environment of respect and dignity and connection and possibility that's generative so that there's a meaning and a purpose to the work we are doing here. And it doesn't have to be a fancy job. It could be answering the phone at Zappos. It could be, I, I wrote about in Lynchpin, a guy who'd worked for years at a coffee shop in New York City, emptying the garbage cans and sweeping the floor. But he felt like the mayor of that little village. He felt like knowing every customer when they came in, being seen and, and seeing others, that was fuel for him. He wasn't working for a paycheck. He got the paycheck because he was choosing to work. Hmm. And you also talk in the book about this car wash and the difference they're making by having, I mean, having a, a sense of purpose, I think. I mean, that's how I, uh, I remember it, actually. The, the, there is a strong sense of purpose in every employee. Um, and somehow, um, I mean, rich people or leaders or, you know, people in, uh, <laughs> I don't know the expression, but the executive, basically, they think that uh, having a sense of purpose can only be for the high hand or the, the, the actual uh, leaders, but not so much for the uh, workers that are down the, the ladder. Yeah. And the example is actually the opposite, I think. I think it's all of us. You know, so Rising Tide Car Wash is for neurodivergent employees, people on the autism spectrum. And 
the thing about this car wash, uh, the person who started it started it so his brother could get a job, is their turnover is very low. Their profit margin is very high. The uh, return on investment for opening a new car wash is less than 90 days. They have built a thing that every one of the constituents, the workers, the employees, the owners, are pleased with. Because when you see with empathy the people you are serving, whether it's your employees or your customers, and give them what they need, they'll come back. And why have we ignored that? And how is it different from a, a standard car wash? Is it because they are using people that are that have disabilities or how how is it making the So when, when you show up as a customer, yeah. your initial inclination is I want my car to be clean. Yes. But that's not real. You don't need a clean car. A clean car is just a story you tell yourself. You see the light in the eyes of the people who are serving you. You understand that they have changed the way each person there works to match what they are capable of. So, you know, they spend a lot of time working with their employees. Does this machine work the way you need it to? If not, we will adjust it. That someone was using a certain kind of rag to clean cars and they discovered that if they just changed it a little bit, their day would get better. So by mm -hmm. focusing on that, they created an engaged workforce. When you're getting your car washed and you see the engaged workforce, that story is valuable to you. So you pay extra. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. It's not that uh, anyone is a source of pity. It's about engagement and connection. And yet you don't want to have disinformation as a mocking argument, right? Because that, that would break everything if you put it as a mocking argument, don't, don't you think? So I guess argument is an interesting word to choose. I think that <laughs> the, the people, it, it doesn't say on the billboard, please be no. a good person and come get your car wash here instead, because that mm. feels manipulative. Yes. But I don't think they hide why they built the car wash or who works there. Mm. And that discovery on the part of the customer makes them feel affiliated, gives them status, yeah. creates the possibility for them to get something of value out of their day. And I think that's the key to what's going on. You know, th there's another chain in the U.S. called Chick-fil-A. And mm. what people don't know about Chick-fil-A is each one has a manager who started at the lowest level, cleaning the grease on the grill. Okay. And that manager now makes $250,000 a year. Wow. And by creating that cycle of people who start with the, the lowest paid job and work their way up to being significantly upper middle class, the entire store reflects that. And so the people who visit a store, it feels different than if you're visiting a McDonald's with an absentee owner. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's so interesting how the, the, the energy you're putting and how you are, and the, the fact, the way you're describing how you can really motivate people and also motivate customers when your company is significant and you're using that word uh, quite often in, in the book, um, significance, Uh, what what does it mean for you uh, to be significant for an organization within that time and uh, this ecological crisis we are going through? Well, I think that significance, I have a very simple definition for it, which is right. significant work is something important that might not work, making a change happen. And so if you work at a place where you cannot make a change happen, where you just have to follow the instructions over and over and over again, you don't feel significant. Mm. Right. So when we think now about this world we live in and the climate, we have to take a deep breath while we still can and realize that convenience and low price has a cost and that it is possible to make a different change happen. And that change is about banding together in community to price carbon appropriately. And that change is about telling each other the truth about where we are and what our options are. It's going to open up a huge opportunity for change, just as AI will, but the industrialists don't want that. They just want us to do what we did yesterday. But uh, in, in the meantime, I could argue 
that, you know, cheap price is great for people that don't have much money. And what would you answer to that? Well, it's interesting. I've spent time in some of the poorest places in the world. And um, one thing you notice is people will buy a cell phone before they will buy clean water. That's true. Right? Why is that? Because the goal isn't just cheap price. The goal is, which is giving me connection, which is giving me productivity, which is giving me a source of meaning. How can I help my family? That the flip side of that is when you show up and say, uh, we have these seeds and if you plant them, they will have a huge impact on your yield as a small hold farmer. A lot of farmers don't buy it. Why is that? They have the money. Mm -hmm. They don't buy it because they're afraid because change is seen as a threat. Because if you've been a 20th generation peasant living from hand to mouth and someone offers you a totally different way to make a living, that's scary. So mm -hmm. people make their own decisions based on the systems that they live in. And I don't believe those decisions are usually based on what's the cheapest. I think they're based on what connects to what I need and to the change I seek to make in the world. Mm. Actually, I was wondering, because you, you mentioned that in the book, and, uh, and I love what you're saying, um, what do you think people need besides significance? Well, I, th I think that everyone need? needs a roof over their heads, enough to eat, and health care. But then what do we need after that? Well, some people like me need stimulation and novelty and a challenge. But some people don't, right? I think in general, people need affiliation and status. Affiliation is who are we with? Who's got my back? Who am I in sync with? Am I wearing the right clothes? What community am I part of? What are the things like around here? And status is, am I moving up or am I moving down? And when we can create a world where someone is getting what they need in terms of affiliation and status, people are much more likely to get to the point where they can achieve dignity. And dignity, I think, is at the heart of what it is to be a human. It's very hard to take dignity, but maybe we have the chance to offer it to people. But um, if I'm following you somehow... So if you have a status, it's also compared to others, is it not? Always. So it means that there will be people that are on, I mean, under you. I don't, I don't know what it means exactly, but somehow, you, I guess you understand what I mean by saying under you. Yes, um, but is that correct? But it's a, it is a cycle that continues forever. So when you mm. are eight years old and you run in the track meet, you might be higher status than some of the other people who ran. But when you're nine, you may have pick a different sport because the world changed for you, right? It's also not, are you comparing your speed to someone who's an Olympic athlete? It's who am I compared to in this room right now? Mm -hmm. And so if we see how people choose to spend their time or their money, we see that around the world, people think about status and affiliation. So in Kibera, Uh, which is a, a slum with two or three million people living in it. I hung out at the Kabira Book Club because we did a whole conversation about one of my books. The people who joined that club joined that club because joining something was important. If you walk through the slums of Kabir, where people are making three or four dollars a day, you notice that each one of the shacks is neater than the next one. Mm. Why? Because it raises the status of my family to not have this thing feel sloppy. So it doesn't matter, you know, when I was, the first time I went to Paris, we bumped into the Miss France competition and there were like oh, 60 wow. women <laughs> all walking down in their sashes and the whole thing it was hysterically funny. And why would you enter the Miss France competition? It, it's not like the prize is worth anything because you're seeking a certain kind of status. Does that mean you hate the person who slightly beat you or you are happy about the person you slightly beat? No. But human beings, we have this need to compare ourselves to who's sitting next to us. Mm -hmm. And because you were talking about the eight, eight years old, I'm wondering if that system is not ingrained in the school system. And so I was wondering, what do you think of the school system now? Yes. The schools don't do learning. They do education. Those are different things. They're about compliance. They're about the indoctrination of fitting in. And... 
we definitely have created systems, certainly in the US, but I think around the world, yeah. all about, will this be on the test? What do I need to do to get an A? Will I get in trouble? Because that's a factory-like way to grow factory workers. But there are other schools, and I've written about them. I did a, a free book called Stop Stealing Dreams that's easy to find. There are other schools that say, you know what? There's 120 kids in this building and no adults, and the kids are going to teach each other. And we don't care what the kids learn as long as they learn something. And you're going to make promises, you're going to keep them, and there's going to be a lot of pure leadership and exploration. And we're going to train resilient leaders, not compliant factory workers. But in an environment like that, there's still status, there's still affiliation, there's still a desire to be who you want to become because that's what makes us humans. Hmm. You were earlier talking about uh, organization and being significant. And I was wondering, because you, you were saying what matters is to bring real value to the society. But then what is real value and how do you measure it? What, which KPI? Basically? Yes, it's a great question. <laughs> I don't think anybody brings value to all of us. We mm. don't have a society. We have many societies. We have many circles and tribes and cadres. And um, the thing that you are working so hard on to make you know better strings for violinists, almost no one's going to notice it except for this violinists you serve. So that is how the market transformed the world, right? There isn't a central uh, body that assigns each person a task that is best for all of us. It is just the sum total of the work we do. And what I'm trying to help people see, because that's what I hear from my readers and others, is we do want to create positive outcome. But I think we have to begin by saying, who's it for and what's it for? This change we seek to make, who are we seeking to help? And what is the change for? So if you're spending your days trying to get more people to smoke cigarettes, I'm not happy with you. And I think that mm -hmm. while you might please a few people who become addicted to nicotine and then die, I don't think you should be proud of that. But that's my choice. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about global, truly global issues like climate, that's when community action kicks in. That I don't think what we do to the climate should be left up to each individual profit-seeking manager. I think we should come as a group to a conclusion about what this world is and where it is going and make rules. We have rules about lots of other things. And it is possible to be a capitalist and like rules. In fact, you can't be a capitalist without rules. If you go to places where there are almost no government agencies, you know, sub-Saharan parts of the world, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There are almost no capitalists because when there's no rules, it's really hard to create value. Hmm. That's an interesting point. I never thought about it like that, actually. That's an interesting point. But when, when you talk about climate, a lot of people are claiming that business somehow uh, or trying to, to make a business significant in the sense of uh, making money is actually opposite to uh, climate issues because then you're producing and it means that you will create uh, CO2 and, uh, mm -hmm. and it will pollute the oceans and, you know, everything, basically. Yeah, so there, there is a compelling argument being made by some people that we need degrowth, mm -hmm. that we need to have the population of the earth and then have it again, and that we need to create a world that is more agrarian and less industrial. I would ask those people, how are we going to do that? Because I don't know. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. Maybe over the course of a couple of generations, that is the way to create the generative earth I would like to leave to my unborn mm -hmm. grandchildren. But no one has described to me how to do that. It feels to me like the market saw, caused this problem. The market found cheap energy, pumped it out of the ground, the market figured out fertilizer. The market figured out uh, all the things that have caused so much of a problem. You know, gas-powered leaf blower mm -hmm. and commercial farming of cows. So let's let the market solve the problem. And the way the market will solve the problem is if we charge the appropriate price for carbon. Mm -hmm. That it makes absolutely no sense that a hamburger should cost five dollars. 
Yeah. It doesn't cost $5. It costs all of us $20. So we should charge what it costs. Because when mm. you start charging what things cost, the market figures out what to do about it. And we're building all of these technologies and systems, but none of them are going to work well unless there's a business model. And the mm. business model is, guess what? If you really want to get on that plane and fly to London, it's going to cost you. And we're going to use all of the money you paid to undo all the damage you did. And if we can't undo it, then we're going to have to charge you more. Because if we can't invent this generative cycle, what else are we going to do? Yeah. I wish a really smart, generous, omnipotent, uh, kind entity was in charge of the whole world and never made a mistake and just told us all what to do. I don't think that's likely to happen. So I need a better plan. And also sometimes you create things without thinking of the impact. I'm always thinking about this person who one day invented plastic mm -hmm. and said, this is amazing. I invented a material that is that will exist forever. So people will not need to buy anything anymore because once they buy it once, right. they will keep it forever. And so this is the greatest invention in history. And yet here we are with uh, plastic in our own body. And I, I don't think that person, I'm not sure who, it, who that is. I was not curious enough to, to, to search for his name or name, but um, I, I don't think he or she had that in mind when he created plastic in the first place. Yeah. No, we're not talking about being evil. The one person invented leaded gasoline and freon gas. Mm. And so he's done more damage to the earth than anybody in history in terms of a single inventor. But you're right, plastic. Now we got 35% of all the plastic produced is for packaging. And we mm. know that 90 plus percent of plastic will never be recycled because it can't be physically. Um, that's why we need boundaries. That's why we need rules. And it's very easy to look at the rules we currently live with and say, well, of course, of course it should be against the law to have a seven-year-old work in your factory. <laughs> 200 years ago, there was, that's all seven-year-olds did is they worked in factories. So we accept these rules. We accept these boundaries. We accept that there's going to be 40 or 35 hours in a week. We accept that um, people are allowed to take a day off if they're sick. Okay, so let's make some new rules so we can make some new decisions. And people think that's too hard to pull off. I don't think it's too hard to pull off. I think if we are connected and patient and impatient at the same time, we can change these rules. You were talking about significance earlier, and I was wondering, how do you create the condition for significance within a company? How do you make that happen? Well, what do you measure? Who gets promoted? Who gets applauded? What shortcuts are you willing to take or not take? When you discover something is working, how do you do it more? Are you racing to the bottom or racing to the top? The, the purpose of the book, and then I, I made a booklet to go with it, is to have a conversation. If we talk about it, about how we're going to interact with each other, about what we're measuring, about what success looks like, it is much more likely to happen. And because your book is about teams, how do you change the culture within the company because I know a lot of leaders uh, and also I'm receiving many on the podcast who have this mindset also because they did their introspections and they know that and because also they have children or grandchildren and they know they want to go in that direction well yeah. then there's the shareholders but there's also the employees and sometimes because people don't like change people uh, have a lot of fear uh, we've discussed that earlier um they, they don't want to change. And it is very hard, actually, to change the culture within an, an organization. And I'm wondering if you thought about that and how, how would you do it? Yeah, it's hard. If it was easy, everyone would have done it already. <laughs> um, yeah. I think we begin with this. You can't change everybody. But what you might be able to do is get enrollment from small teams of people that want to change something. And once we change a little thing, and celebrate it, we can do it again. And so the way culture changes bit by bit is by acknowledging something and then doing it again. So in the US, there's a chain of stores called Kinko's and Paul mm -hmm. Orfalia built it from one tiny store with one employee to the point where he sold it for over $2 billion. And the way Paul built the, he's 
dyslexic. He's almost illiterate. The way he built the company is he would visit a store and he would say, what's new? What's working? And if you were behind the counter and you could not answer his question, you were in trouble. He created a culture where what's new, what's working was something you had to have an answer for. And then he would go to the next door and tell them what was new and what was working at the last store. And they would copy from each other over and over and over and over again. That culture was on purpose, right? So we can change the culture of an organization. If you look at how Danny Meyer has built Union Square Cafe and the mm-hmm. Shake Shack Empire, mm-hmm. it's these little things, these questions, these what are we measuring? Who are we rewarding? Where are the people who want to come with me and open a new store? Who are the ones who are going to stay here? As we create status and affiliation around significance, it will happen more. Mm. But on the other hand, if you're sitting there with a stopwatch and measuring today's P&L, that's what you're going to get. Mm. And because you, you talked about how Tony was hiring, uh, at least the company, uh, and I heard you saying that you only hire people that you've been already working with, which sounds weird <laughs> in the first place. Yes. And I was like, how do you do that? Well, right now I have no employees on purpose, but right. um, I used to think I was really good at hiring. I would hire people all the time. I, I grew one of the first internet companies to a lot of people. What I discovered was I was really good at having a short meeting with someone and deciding if I wanted to have coffee with them and then hiring them. Mm-hmm. wasn't really good at hiring people who were good at doing their job. I was hiring people who were good at interviewing. <laughs> and we now live in a different world. And it's a world where all the talent is visible to you online. It's a world where freelancers are delighted to do projects for you. So my method is simple. I hire you to do a project and I pay you. And if you're really good at it and it went well, I do it again. And if you're the kind of person that can add value by joining the team, I invite you to join the team. Mm -hmm. That it's not about getting people to work for free. It's about hiring people to do a project because we're in Mm -hmm. the project business now. And if we're good at doing a project, who cares what you look like? Who cares if you're good at interviewing? That's not one of the things we do around here. We do this. If you're good at this, Come, come, we need you. And somehow what you're explaining is also that people will remain who they are. So meaning that if they, the way they work as a freelancer is probably the way they will work eventually also. It is possible for people to change. The army does it. The yes. French Foreign Legion does it. It's just really painful and expensive. Mm-hmm. So for most organizations, it's easier to hire people who are going where you're going than it is to hire people, trap people, and then force them to change. <laughs> I like also that when you, when you talk about how industrial capitalism was really to track people, as you just explained, and you know track them and make them work. And when it sounds more um, relevant to give them significance and so that they are motivated by themselves to do the work. Uh, and th- that, I think, is what... I mean, that's uh, what I remember mostly from your book, like this idea that eventually what you need to do is create this significance within people, uh, this sense of purpose, let's say, so that they are motivated by doing the job, basically. Um, and, it, and money is not the thing. I mean, and I had the discussion with the CEO of Best Buy, and he was explaining exactly that, that money is great. But it's great for when you were working as a blue collar on a, on a line. But um, for most people now, this is not working anymore. And yes. I was wondering what you, what you think about that. Money is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. That there are plenty of very unhappy dentists because <laughs> dentists make money, but they don't feel significant. That's true. Lawyers and, also. <laughs> and so... As we wrap up this conversation, I think that the takeaway is it's easy to say under the circumstances, I'm doing the best I can. And what I'm trying to tell people is you are the circumstances. You are the person who is going to establish the culture and what you're measuring. And you can choose to lead, even if you're not the boss, even if you don't own the place, you can find a place to lead. Mm -hmm. And when you lead, you create significance. 
Can I ask you just one more question sure. because we didn't talk about it? Uh, and you mentioned AI, and I was wondering what your take on AI and uh, the job loss. I mean, a lot of people are talking about how AI will replace many jobs, and I was wondering what's your take on that. I was born in 1960, and since the day I was born, we have created more than 5 billion jobs on this planet. We created all of those jobs at the very same time we were inventing all this technology that re apparently replaces all these jobs. Mm. I think it's pretty clear that AI is going to invent more jobs than it's going to destroy. That's what technology has always done. AI is going to make a mess. AI is going to lead to all sorts of cataclysm. AI is going to be a challenging, magical thing, but it's not going to eliminate jobs. That's for sure. Perfect. Thank you so much, Seth. That was so, so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate you. Go make a ruckus. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you.